Okay. Good. Let's begin. Okay, students. Um, for those of you that uh, got here a little bit late, for those of you that didn't get up to the front fast enough, uh, we've got all your exam printouts up here. And if we didn't get to it, um, if, if we didn't get, you, if, if you didn't get yours um, the first go around, we just have a huge number of exam printouts to go through, over 200. So we got to do it quickly. We go through the list once. I split the, I split the printouts in half. And uh, Brandon gets half and I get half. And we just go through it once. If you can't get up here, if, we, or if you're late a little bit late, we'll get you after class. So it's normal. Don't, uh, you know, don't make anything, uh, you know, don't be upset about it. It happens. Uh, let's talk about the, the printouts that you've got. You may not have ever seen one of these. The printout that you've got is based on 46 points, not five not 50. So for that reason, oh, by the way, before I get any further, there's a few of you that blew your, um, uh, your PID or your test form. And so we don't have a printout for you. Um, it, did anybody, did any, anybody, you were up here and you didn't hear your name called? Raise your, okay. So if, if you didn't hear your name called, that means you probably blew your PID or something like that. Which means you might not get a printout, but we'll try to get it sorted out and and so forth. So it it ha that's why we check. That's why we're we're so paranoid about it when you're handing stuff in, because if you don't get it, the PID on there, you don't. They don't know whose paper it is. But I have to figure it out. So, was there a question in the back? A comment or did you? Okay. Um, all right, so this printout that you're, you're looking at, I want you to look at it carefully, all right? Now, at, in the upper left is your name, and it says Exam 1 Scantron. Um, so the printout percentage in the upper right is not accurate. That is based on 46 points, but our exam had clicker questions worth four more points so total uh, basis is 50 points. But the Scantron does, doesn't know anything about that. So the percentage up there is not your total percentage for the exam. All right. Uh, now your total points and, the, and your raw score, those are accurate. That tells you how many dots you got correct. All right. So just keep that in mind. Now I want you to look carefully at your paper for two bubbling errors that you may have. And if you do, we'll try to get them sorted out. Just like, we, you know, the PID bloopers and stuff, we'll get those sorted out eventually. And if you have the following errors, we'll get them sorted out as well. Do you have blank? Because a blank will be marked wrong. Look at your printout carefully, if you've got it. For those of you that have to pick it up after class, you can check it out after class, all right? Anybody have a blank? All right, a couple of you. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to collect your, I want you to give those to me at the end of class, your printouts, and then we'll go and look through the, the actual scantrons and see if it really was a blank or if you erased something and or it wasn't dark enough. Okay, because sometimes the machine will think it's, it's a blank, but you actually did bubble in something there, okay? Now the other uh, error I want you to look for is look on your test. Do you have two answers for any of your questions? Because that'll be marked incorrect as well. All right, so look at your printout. Anybody have two answers? Okay. Uh, good. Uh, you guys, same thing. Bring it up after class and we'll, we'll look at your scan, try and see if you really did have two dots. If you had two dots, then... Um, will sort we, you, you it'll be incorrect but if you had one dot and then one that you erased but not well enough and it, it thought it was another dot i'll be able to see that even though the computer can't see it uh, did you have a question in the back it yeah uh what's your first name again okay um so it just bring it your pronouncer and we'll give them back to you on thursday hopefully 
Uh, any qu any other questions about that kind of thing? Yeah. The clicker question. All right. There was a clicker question about calculating the eccentricity. And what I found was that a, a big percentage of people did get it correct. So even though there was a, an error uh, from the test bank on the matching item, which I didn't catch, um, but which uh, uh, another student did catch, um, uh, most people actually did calculate that correctly. Okay, in addition, uh, I graded very leniently on that. And so if you had any part of the correct answer for that one, uh, let's see, I believe the correct answer was 0 0.6. And uh, if you had 0.36 or 0.64, that's part of the calculation for that problem, I gave you plus one even if you didn't have the full correct answer. So that's how I decided to deal with it because most people figured out how to do the eccentricity uh, without, even though that first formula was wrong. Now, I haven't analyzed yet that actual question. All right, now that's uh, question number one or question number two, depending on which test you had. If I find that enough people have, um, when I look at the results, if I feel that uh, enough people got it wrong, and I have to look at each test form to see if that one was markably uh, messed up, uh, then I'll just resubmit the scantrons, put them through the machine again, and improve, you know, give everybody points. Okay, so, but I think that that one's going to be looking pretty good. I think most people know what that formula was. So that's how I'm going to deal with that. Okay, if you didn't get any points. Uh, on the iClicker part, the iClicker uh, part of your exam score is already visible on your grades page. Your Scantron is not. I will put it, uh, make it visible after class. I always try to hand out the exam printouts first and then make the Scantron score possible. Everybody in here knows what their score is now. Almost everybody. Uh, but um, as I was saying, um, uh, I'll, if I have to resubmit them, and I've done, the, occasionally we have to resubmit stuff if there's, a, if there's a problem with the exam key that we didn't check or that we didn't catch before the test, uh, we'll do that. So, so we'll, I'll let you guys know what's happening with that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but the, the, the bulk of the people that, um, and I can actually sort it out for who was doing it after I made that uh, announcement and who did it before. But the point, the, the, the thing about that, the clicker item is most people did get it right. And I gave a lot of points on, on that particular question because of that. Um, the other thing that, I'm just trying to think. Um, I, I'll just leave it at that. And if, if I have to go back and regrade and stuff, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, I didn't. I, I said that because, yeah, because most, and when I looked at the grades and stuff, I realized that most people were able to handle it. Now, you can, if you want to talk to me about it after class, I'll be happy to do that. And we'll try to figure out a, a solution for you uh, personally. That's not a problem. Okay. Now, another thing I want to make a mention to you about, and that is in web courses right now, the, the only grade that's visible for this exam is the clicking part. And if you got a minus one, that means I don't have any clicks from you. If you have a zero, that means I did get clicks from you. Um, your clicker was in there, but you didn't get anything right. Okay. 
So, so students that didn't have any clicks, you're looking at a minus one there. Now that doesn't mean I take minus one off your exam total at the end of the semester. It just signifies that there's an error with your clicker. You know, some of you guys uh, didn't bring your clicker, but I think I've got all your guys' points in there. But other people, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't, like one student didn't have the right kind of clicker and stuff like that. Uh, there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's what it looks like. Now, if you have a Scantron problem, um, a blooper, and, and we haven't figured out what your grade is, it'll show up as a minus one until we do figure out what your grade is. So in, in a class this size, it happens, from, it happens every exam. You know, somebody always, you know, messes up their PID or they don't bubble it in dark enough or they forget the test form, stuff like that. But we usually get it caught up after, you know, a few, few days, maybe a week. Another question. Yeah. Yeah, you had both of the equations on the matching. Yeah, and I already explained. I, I, I was just explaining that over here. Okay, that was the that was the eccentricity equation. Okay, and I didn't catch the I didn't catch the error in the test bank until um, till afterwards. But I graded it. Le See, on the clicker, I look at everybody's what what they click in. Everybody's answer. I look at every single one. It's very easy to do. And on that one, I graded leniently for that, okay? No, I didn't. I kept, most people figured out how to calculate it. Right. All right, meet me after class. We'll talk over a solution. The two of you, it's fine. It's normal. It's perfect. It's good. All right, we'll get you the... We'll get you sorted out. Another question. Yeah. Yeah, I've got that on the next slide. Another question. Okay, here's what the grades look like. If I were going to give a letter grade on a test, which I normally don't do, but if I were, uh, the A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's stack up in this way. Um, and you can see there is, there's a lot of good grades. Um, and uh, the average, here's up at the, dude, you asked. Yeah, it's right up there. Okay. 35.6. So that's like 71.2%. That's about what I shoot for on a Midterm, 78% average. And usually I'm, you know, within 1% or 2%, either high or low. Today, this, this exam, I'm a little high. Uh, but that's good. I'm happy about that. All right. Um, any other questions about that stuff? And if you have more questions, um, you feel free to come up and talk after class, and we'll get any individual questions you have ironed out. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, there's a couple new things that I've linked to the home page. Uh, and uh, I, the, the home page looks a little different now, different background image. Uh, first thing is uh, I have uh, set up a page for uh, basic information about the UCF Astronomy Society and the observation sessions uh, that they hold every week, the public sessions, to which you are uh, invited to go. I sometimes go. I enjoy going. And if the weather is good, I want everybody here to feel free to go. If you go, you get a, uh, an observation sheet that you fill out. You put your name on it. And you put your instructor's name on it. That's me or your section number. And then the, the students at the observatory uh, will get it to me. They'll put it in my campus mailbox over in the physics department. Um, also, there's a page with exam blurbs, and I want to discuss that 
uh, right now. The exam blurbs um, is a page uh, in which there's a that, that there will be a PDF file for each test, each form of each test, that has for each item on the test a short description of the question. Uh, so basically the gist of each question from 1 through 46 um, on, on the Scantron part of the test. Um, they're not verbatim, but they're indicative of the basic topic. We used to be able to do this with the old testing software and with uh, UCF uh, web courses when it was Blackboard. We can't really do it now with, the, with Canvas and stuff, but we'll put together something by hand. Um, and as soon as we do, I'll post it on this page. So it'll be, uh, this is the exam blurbs page. And right here it says TBA, to be announced. So in the next week or so, I'll have those PDF files for you. And so you can look at your exam. Oh, there's a bug up here. You can look at your exam form. And, uh, you know, it says uh, test form right in the middle of the top. It says test form C on this one. Uh, so look at yours, and then you'll, you'll be able to look at your blurb sheet and then figure out uh, which ones you got wrong. So what you want to do is use that as a study tool for the final exam. Because with the blurb sheets you, that, um, that you're going to get, um, you'll be able to identify each problem that you got wrong. A actually, you'll be able to identify every problem. And the way that I have it set up, it actually links to either um, a concept, uh, an assignment in masteringastronomy.com, or a lecture date. Almost everyone, every single question. Uh, is linked in that way. Uh, so it'll be pretty ha helpful for you uh, to study. In addition, there'll be a separate blurb sheet for the clicking questions. Okay, so you'll be able to look at the clicking questions and see how to solve them and, uh, in, in case you did get them incorrect. All right, now questions about that stuff, blurb sheets and so forth. Okay. Um, if you were dissatisfied with your exam performance, uh, let me remind you that um, we have office hours um, 9 o'clock to 10.30 on Wednesdays in room 158. That's my office hours. Brandon has office hours in the physical science building in the atrium, one of the big cafe tables out there, from 11 a.m. to noon. So hopefully you can hit one of those too. Um, a second thing that will really help you is to find a study partner uh, or maybe a study group, form a study group. Uh, and so if you have somebody on your floor in the dormitory uh, or a friend of yours is, that's in class and they're doing pretty good, um, see if you can seek them out. If you don't know anybody in class, try to make friends. You know, that's always a good thing to do. And if you do, um, I can tell you that um, what we want you to do on exams is to think, all right? So memorizing is not what is required. And I want you to be able to recognize and think on your feet, all right? And so um, studying with another person is going to help you do that. You know, there's all kinds of facts that you can memorize, but uh, that's not what scientists do. Sci I mean, that's what encyclopedias do. That's what the engineering students do. I mean, they memorize stuff, I guess. But uh, to think scientifically, that's what we're looking for. And that's if you want to get an A, if you want to ace it. Okay? And we didn't get anybody that, I'm pretty sure we didn't get anybody that aced it. Uh, I think somebody got a 49 out of 50, which is pretty nice. Okay? But if you want to ace it, you've got to be able to, Use your coconut and think on your feet. If you do want to um, make a study group, you are welcome uh, to use discussions to do that. But please do not post your phone number or your personal email address in discussions. You can, sit, you can do messaging, but don't do that in discussion, in the discussions area. And uh, we'll, 
you know, will delete it if you, if you do that. So, but you can do it in me just private messaging inside web courses. That's perfectly fine. A third thing that you can do, and this is something that my TA in, in one of my other classes found when she was taking my class, uh, she found that looking at the video recordings uh, that this semester we're putting in YouTube uh, really helps to rework the notes and so that she was able to take uh, basic notes in lecture and then uh, just kind of fill them in and, and elaborate them afterward after she listened to the lecture uh, again. And the, you know, the YouTube it is amazing. I saw a guy the night before the, the, I don't know if it was a guy or a girl, but I saw a student post in, in web courses discussions. Wow, did you know that Dr. Brickner has all the lectures pod, podcasts on YouTube? And it was you. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, it's been, I've been doing that since the first day. So anyways, we finally got through. Uh, but it's, it's a nice tool and because you can go back and just listen to, you know, if it's just five minutes that you missed, you know, you can just go back and re-listen to that five minutes and go back over it, you know, point by point, and it really helps out. All right, so uh, for those of you that want to get an A, which I know is everybody in here, um, if, if you take these three uh, instructions to mind and, and, uh, and you know, stay with it, uh, you'll see uh, your grades improving. About the UCF Astronomy uh, Astronomical Society, their web page contains this. One of their web pages is this one, the Nights Under the Stars uh, public event schedule. And this is last uh, Thursday. They went. They, they uh, had a session. And when I was getting the exam ready Thursday morning, it was still yellow. But here, um, the other day, I went and looked, and they were green. And the student... At least one student told me that they went. So let's do, uh, let me back up. In the UCF Astronomy Society webpage in our web courses, you can look at this schedule page. Every session is there. Now this is the next one coming up. This is tomorrow night, 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. Okay, it's still white. So it's, or at least when I made this uh, screen grab. It was still white. It might be yellow now, but is it? It's yellow now? Yeah. So it's, it's a maybe. If it's yellow, that means maybe. But last Thursday, it was yellow until it went green, and then everybody, you know, a bunch of people went. So, um, so just keep your eye on that, especially if you want to get bonus points. As many times, Anton, as you go to the observatory and do your observations, do the sheet, turn it in, and I get it, you get 10 bonus points. You know, and they got a bunch of other uh, dates lined up. They got four or five more for this semester. And if, you, if they go, if the weather cooperates, and you go four times, that's, a, that's almost a full midterm. I mean, you can, you can go crush this class with impunity if you do that. So, I mean... If, but the thing is, you got to be able to squeeze it into your busy schedule, and you got to be, and the weather's got to cooperate, and that's always a big if. So, you know, they may not have any more sessions at all this semester, but if they do, I want you to see if you can try your hardest to get in there and observe. Now, I'm going to ask you a clicker question. Go ahead and turn on your clickers. We're on frequency. What are we? AA. Frequency AA. If you have your clicker for the first time, press the power button and hold it down until you get the flashing square and then type in the letter AA, letters AA, and that'll be good. And the first question is just about the observing session. Um, I just want everybody's going to get a point on this one. Uh, I'll make sure everybody. Uh, so go ahead and vote. Yeah, you'll get a Go Nitro in just a second. Frequency AA. Yeah, go ahead and vote. And a yes will get you one point, and a, and a no will get you one point. I'll score both of them correct. So, so don't worry about that. I just want to see how many people went. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm gonna give I'll show you how to get there in just a second. I have it all prepared for you. Yeah, that's the Robinson Observatory. Okay, ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, uh, let's see what you guys. Okay, good. We got we got a bunch. Most people didn't make it, but twelve of you did. That's good. All right. So next time. Uh, hopefully, actually, the next session is Wednesday night. So if Wednesday night is green, uh, I might ask this question again on Thursday class, and hopefully we'll get something bigger than 12. All right, question. It's a good thing you ask because I have it ready. You know where the, I, the UCF water tower is? You know where that is, right? Everybody knows where that is. I mean, you can see it from all. So, go, so here's how you go. You go to the UCF water tower. Okay, and then you go past the Pegasus garage, the parking garage, and then you go past the UCF police station, all right, and then right after that, you kind of swing a left, and I believe it's called Era Drive, A-R-A, -A, or Neptune Drive, something like that, and then you get to this thing. This this is the although it's going to be dark when you go out there. So if you want to scout it out, you know ahead of time. That's that's how you do it. So just to recap, you go to the water tower, go past there to Libra parking garage, go past that to the police station, and then kind of right after that, you turn left into the and you go about I don't know eighth of a mile in. Yeah, just show up and what they'll do is, um, so the question was, do you have to sign up or do you just show up? And it's just come as you are, if you can, and just go, and they'll give you, and you tell them you're an astronomy 2002 student, and they'll give you a, a handout. Um, is this, who went last time? A bunch of you went. Is that correct? I mean, they give you a handout, and what did you guys observe? Hold on a second. I, I can you repeat? Repeat what you observed? Hold on a second. Uh, it's... Try, try again. <laughs> the Beehive Galaxy, the Beehive Nebula. And, and uh, the moon. Or, Orion's Belt, good. All right, and I was, and it was a crescent moon. By the way, let me uh, give you an admonition about observing the moon. It's really good to observe the moon um, with binoculars, uh, or if you have a telescope of your own. But it, it, a lot of you will have binoculars or a spotting scope if you're a hunter. Um, but do not observe the full moon with binoculars because all that light is being um, magnified and intensified and you can harm the retina of your eye doing that. But a crescent moon, half moon or less, go ahead. But if it's more than a half moon, um, don't look at it directly with your um, spotting scope or, or your binoculars. All right. And just so you know, uh, what is your name? <coughs> Matthew? Matthew and the rest of you that did go, there will probably be a different observing program tomorrow night. So if you want to go again and you want to see something else, they'll probably have something. You know, like they might be uh, looking at the rings of Saturn or, or Jupiter, the, the, the satellites of Jupiter. So The big one? The big telescope, the four, the Galilean moons. That's right, just like Galileo. Yeah. Question back here. Uh, I don't think the complete. You're going to be there for most of the time, but um, 
it just depends, you know, how, how many people are there, you know. It's fun, you know. Uh, so, yeah, block out most of your, don't, don't expect to um, finish before two hours, but if you, you, you might, and if you do, so much the better. Okay? So, uh, and if you can't, um, you know, just do, do what you can. All right? Another question. Yeah. Yeah, that's for the club, their, their club meeting. So if you want to join the society, you can go to that meeting. That's at 6. And, yeah, the, their session begins, what, at 7.30, did it say? Yeah, so, yeah, so. But, you know, a lot of people from this class end up joining the society, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, did somebody else have a question over here? Okay, let's continue. Uh, and here in big, bold letters, just to re remind you, 10 bonus points. All right, always a popular topic. Okay, I want to give you a little blurb about the gravitational wave detection. We had a lecture uh, last Thursday. It came out in the news about 10 o'clock, 1030. Uh, and uh, last Thursday... Uh, in my other class, and we, we dismissed early and, and looked at some of it, some of the news. Um, and just to give you an idea of this gravitational wave, what they're about, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Um, elect I, I want to compare gravitational waves to electromagnetic waves. They're going to miss a lot of questions. We've got a bunch coming up. Uh, electromagnetic radiation. The source of electromagnetic radiation is electric charges that accelerate. All right, that's the basic thing. Um, so, for instance, um, if you connect a big wire to a metal tower, you can cause the electrons in the tower to rattle back and forth at a particular rate. And if your rate is 580,000 cycles per second, that is WDBO, ESPN Sports Radio, AM. And FM has a different frequency, but that's how electromagnetic waves are generated, something like that. You know, always charges the, that accelerate. Now, gravitational waves are similar in that um, the source is a gravitational mass that accelerates. An example of that is simply the Earth orbiting the Sun. But the amount of gravitational waves that are emitted in that process are very, very low. Uh, we had a colloquium uh, in, uh, on Thursday, no, sorry, Friday, uh, about this gravitational wave, and the guy giving the colloquium said, yeah, the Earth orbiting the Sun is about 20 watts of gravitational waves total. So it's pretty dim. But now the two large black holes that were interacting that they were able to observe, that is big. Those are very, very bright. And let me um, continue the comparison uh, between gravitational and electromagnetic waves. Um, the, this next slide, this should be uh, number three. And the comparison uh, here in item three is that gravity is much weaker. So to see any gravitational waves from a force that is intrinsically weaker than electromagnetism, you have to have something enormously bright, enormously, or in gravitational terms, very violent something like black holes smashing into each other, which is what they observed. Okay, now, here's a uh, convenient way to um, compare uh, the two forces. I say that gravity is weaker than electromagnetism. Think of a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom, the basic hydrogen, is a proton and an electron. And the main force 
that holds the um, hydrogen atom together is electromagnetic. The electromagnetic interaction of the proton and the electron. Opposites attract. All right? That's the main force. But the proton and the electron, they both have mass. They both have you know, a very small fraction of a gram of mass, and so they have a gravitational interaction. Okay? So there's a force of gravity in the atom. It's very small. Let's call the size of that force um, 1. If the force of gravity is 1, then the electromagnetic interaction is a 1, followed by 40 zeros. And that, my wonderful students, is enormous. The electromagnetic um, interaction is 10 to the 40th power stronger than gravity. Centimeter for centimeter, meter for meter. So, in other words, however many... Um, units of force an electron and a proton experience electromagnetically, there's a 10 to the 40th power smaller force gravitationally. And for that reason, it is easy for us to see visible light, electromagnetic radiation with our eye. We have a very hard time seeing any gravitational waves. We have a hard time seeing or detecting gravitational waves of any kind. Now, our eye is not adapted for X-rays or ultraviolet. It's not adapted for infrared, radio, or microwave. That's all right, because we have detectors for those. You know, we have X-ray telescopes. We have radio telescopes. We got everything. But gravitational waves, we have not been able to observe until now. We've detected their presence but we've never actually observed anything shaking. If those waves hit Earth, they should be able to shake something. All right, now it's a very small shaking going on uh, for almost anything in the universe, except for these black holes. The way that we detect them is the LIGO machine, and that's called uh, L-I-G-O, laser, and you can look it up. There, there's some extra readings now. In, in web courses uh, about this. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory or Gravitational Wave Observatory, L-I-G-O. And it's now known as A-LIGO, uh, Advanced LIGO, A for Advanced. Uh, but they've been working on LIGO for 20 years. They finally uh, found something. The LIGO detector is so sensitive, you know, it'll pick up earthquakes from Japan easy. I mean, we got seismographs that'll do that. That's no, that's no great shakes. I mean, you got to have a good seismograph, but, um, you know, we can't feel an earthquake in Japan with our feet, but we can easily build a seismograph to do that. This thing will detect the surf pounding hundreds of miles away. And so we have to isolate it from that. We have to filter out all those, those extraneous noises, those extraneous rattles in, in the machine that are caused by the ocean, caused by somebody in the control room dropping their lunchbox or tripping the, over their own two feet and taking a face plant in the, in the hallway. Yeah, they'll, they'll pick it up. So they got to try to filter that out. They have to isolate it. Um, you know, somebody in a dump truck, a hundred miles away, they can pick up. So they have to filter out all that stuff, and because uh, the devices are very, very, they're big and they're very sensitive, they can pick up very, very small vibrations. Um, but only the gravitational ones are the ones that they're trying to get. They have not been able to do that until just a few months ago in September uh, of 2015. Uh, they saw this. Now here's the shake. All right. This is in their detector out in Hanford, Washington. Uh, Hanford, Washington is up in the Columbia Plateau. So here it is. It's just kind of you know bopping around here, and then all of a sudden, 
Whoa, they got a big shake and it got really tight. These waves are really tight here. And then it diminished down back to the background level. Now out in Livingston, Louisiana, that's their other LIGO detector. Big, huge, eight kilometer uh, long device. Uh, the blue here is what they observed down there. Now this faint red here in the background is this from Hanford, Washington, um, flipped upside down and then moved along the time, the time axis is the horizontal axis. They moved this red signal 0.07 seconds into the future, excuse me, 0.007, seven milliseconds. That's the amount of time it takes light to move from Hanford to Louisiana. Seven milliseconds, it's not very far, and it doesn't take much time, seven milliseconds. And when they did that, they got almost perfect overlap. And that's when they knew, because they're not going to get the same noise. You know, the, the surf noise out in Oregon and Washington State is different from the surf noise down in Louisiana. Louisiana is pretty close to the Gulf of Mexico, about 100 miles, not even, right? And they're about 200 miles or so from, or 300 miles uh, from the Pacific in Hanford, Washington. So anytime, and you can see that right in here. This part right here, it's not, there's, there's no match, but right in here, that's a match, baby, and they got it. Now, down here, these are the theoretical models. So what they did was they got eggheads like me to figure out what would two black holes do when they spiral around each other in their last half lap around each other before they merge together and blow off all this energy as gravitational radiation. So accelerated, so violent, that enormous amounts of wave energy propagate outward in the fabric of space-time. Well, I've never done this particular modeling, but I know how to do it. I've done other modeling. And all you do is, you, you, what they do is they, they make up a gallery. They make up a gallery of two black holes, and, what do, and they figure out what two black holes would do. One that's 20 times the mass of the sun and one that's 21 times the mass of the sun. They figure out, you know, how many waves and what the waves look like when, when those two merge. And then they do 20 and 22. And then they do 20 and 23. And then they do 20 and 24. 20 times the mass of the sun and another one 24 times the mass of the sun. And they figure out what the waves look like. And when they got to 29 and 36, they got it. And that's what these are down here. These are the theoretical models of what they should get with a, a black hole 29 times the mass of the sun smashing into a black hole 36 times the mass of the sun. They're big black holes, but they're not the biggest. So they're, 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 they're good-sized black holes. So this is the theoretical prediction. This is what they actually observed. And this down here is you subtract the theoretical from the observation, and this is the leftovers, what they call the residual. And what that tells you is the leftovers look like just random noise. And that means that your model is almost a perfect match for your observation. And so that means that 29 and 36 times the mass of the sun were the masses of the black holes that generated this really, really small rattle in those big observatories. Now, I've posted uh, a cool looking video and a news article from the journal Science, which is one of the uh, best of the American Science journals. And those links are in the extra readings page. Uh, we'll probably have some homework about it later this week. So. Uh, you can start looking. It, it's easy to read. It's not a technical article. Uh, and the video is just kind of cool to look at, even if you turn the sound off. It shows what the black holes uh, are doing or what they predict, you know, their models predict for the black holes. So it's kind of cool. Anyway, so this is the money, this, this data right here. This is from the actual technical uh, journal article in physics review, physical review letters. Okay, this is it. 
This is what all my colleagues, my theoretical colleagues and my observational colleagues were drooling over last all weekend from Thursday lunchtime. Uh, you could barely get this. You could barely, barely download this article. Everybody is hitting it. But I got it, and I made an extraction for you guys and for my other classes. And this is the money. This is the payoff. This is, you know how much they spent? They spent almost a billion dollars over the last 20 years to build this, this observatory. And, there's, and the Italians have got one. The Japanese have got one. And there's another one in Germany. And I, I, I think there's one in England, or they're thinking about building one in England. But we got it. We were the first ones to get it. Because uh, the other guys were not even turned on. You know, on the day that this rang, this is like a, this is like a buzzer. It, in theoretical uh, acoustics, if this were a sound wave, this would be the sound of a chirp. It starts out at low frequency here, and then really high frequency, high pitch here. And that would be a chirp. And the time scale here is less than a second. So it's, it's incredible. Uh, but we had ours uh, running, we got it, and uh, we're going to start getting more and more of them. Uh, you know, as soon as the Italian, the Italians have got a pretty good machine, but it wasn't on, it was down for maintenance at the time. So we're going to get more of these, it's going to be exciting. And there's a lot to learn. So um, that's good. Now, let's keep going and, and talk about planetary concepts. Have your clickers ready, because I have a couple clicker questions for you. And these are in the nature of kind of general IQ test. I want you to read carefully and see if you can answer um, the following questions based on your common everyday um, knowledge. Uh, your knowledge of ammonia. Uh, is it useful for brushing your teeth? Etc. Etc. Hopefully, nobody votes for A. Ten seconds to vote. Fifteen seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys have got. Huh. I didn't really stump many of you. Yeah, ammonia's <laughs> I figured most of you'd know this. Uh, yeah, ammonia is kind of stinky, uh, stinky stuff, and it's pungent. But it's actually a significant, go ahead and make a note. This is more than just an IQ test. Um, it's a significant um, component in the atmospheres of the outer planets. We see a lot of um, spectral features for ammonia. And H3. Uh, and I, I can't remember what figure this is, but it's a figure from your textbook. So just mark down uh, figure from textbook, structure of the planets. And in this, you'll see ammonia mentioned a couple times. Okay. Now, next question. Uh, and this one's another uh, IQ test question. Uh, see if, you, if I can stump you guys on this one. This lady's nose is getting paralyzed. But is it oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, gold, silver, or chuctanium? The element discovered by Chuck Norris. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, 
six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. A few of you voted for nitrogen and oxygen. And actually, nitrogen is part of ammonia. So I guess I should give that one a point as well. Um, here's what, uh, here's a famous, famous uh, molecule, hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Uh, this is the stuff that if you smell it, it smells like rotten eggs. Okay. If you've ever, uh, sometimes you go to a, a different town around Florida or other places in the United States, and the water has a smell of of rotten eggs sometimes. It's from hydrogen sulfide. And sulfur in general can have kind of odiferous, I don't know why that is, but anyways, that appears to be the property of sulfur. So let's keep talking about uh, the other stuff that's inside the planets, the outer planets. Let's do a little bit, and then we'll finish uh, on Thursday. Um, the core. So this is figure 8.3. Uh, we're still in chapter Ocho. Uh, rock metal and hydrogen compounds. Now this is kind of interesting. Uh, here's a little pie uh, of the earth, a pie slice of the earth. And here's the similar proportional slice of Jupiter, but it's much more gigantic. And you can see that according to the, the current theories, the core of Jupiter, you know, rock metal and hydrogen compounds... Uh, is the size of Earth. So it's, I don't know, it's just an enormous planet. And then the outer layers are metallic hydrogen, and then liquid hydrogen, and then gaseous hydrogen. Um, so, you know, the core is rock metal, and then three different phases, uh, gaseous, liquid, and solid for hydrogen. We have a hard time doing that in the laboratory. We can... Um, Manufacture gaseous hydrogen, we can liquefy hydrogen, but getting metallic hydrogen is not easy on our planet. Uh, but Jupiter is such high pressure that uh, they can do it. Now, the outer cloud tops uh, of Jupiter, that's where all the colors are, okay? Uh, that is uh, loaded with stuff like ammonia and, and you know, different sulfur compounds and stuff. And we can see the spectra for them when we look at it uh, carefully. Now, if you compare Saturn to that, if you try to look at a similar uh, pie-shaped wedge of Saturn, you'll find that you have to go a lot deeper proportionally to get to the metallic hydrogen, all right? To get all these phase transitions from gaseous to liquid, liquid to, to metallic, you got to go a little bit deeper. Now, here's the um, figure that shows that, 8.4. And you might ask yourself, well, why is that? You know, Jupiter's dense layers, um, you don't have to go, this is like 10% of the way down to the core of Jupiter, and already you're getting liquid hydrogen here. But you got to go way deeper over here for, for Saturn. All right, and then you don't even get to it over here for Uranus and Neptune. So, and now this is figure 8-4. Now the reason for that is this um, particular uh, analogy, the pillows analogy, and this is from figure 8-2. Building a planet of hydrogen and helium is like making uh, one out of fluffy pillows. So in other words, every layer, Jupiter's got more hydrogen and more helium. Okay, and because of that, it's squished down a lot more. All right? And that means it squishes things down to high pressure um, at only 10% of its depth compared to Saturn. You know, 10% of Saturn's depth, it's pretty high pressure compared to Earth, but not like Jupiter, not like 10% of Jupiter, because Jupiter's got a lot more mass. Now, uh, so make a note, uh, page 215 and figure 8.2. And go ahead and read around in that area um, tonight if you, if you feel like it. 
Um, atmospheric pressure. Let's talk a few minutes about atmospheric pressure on Earth compared to atmospheric pressure on Jupiter. Now, on Earth, fair weather at sea level is, is considered to be 1.01325 bars, or if you listen to the Weather Channel, uh, 1,013.25 millibars. The Weather Channel is always talking about millibars. So like here's Hurricane Ivan from a few years back. Uh, the center, um, the central pressure, bad hurricane, 910 millibars. Way low pressure. But fair weather, you know, like out here in Texas, uh, on this day, on the day that this image was taken, uh, that's fair weather out there. And sea level here, so like Houston or something, uh, about 1,013 millibars out there. And 910 here in the eye which go ashore over by Mobile, Alabama. Okay, now Jupiter has one bar um, of atmosphere way out in its cloud layers. Here's, here's the, this is the same diagram. And the pressure is out here in this, in this uh, column here. The cloud tops, you've got an already enough pressure way out in the clouds uh, equivalent to Earth's atmosphere. And then you just keep going down. Look at this pressure. 500,000 bars of pressure. Whoa! That's like 500,000 uh, uh, Earth atmospheres. And the temperature is extremely hot. 2,000 Kelvin. 100 Kel... Excuse me. 373 Kelvin is the boiling point of water. Okay, 2,000 Kelvin is cooler than the surface of the sun, but it's still pretty cotton picking hot, all right? And the pressure is 5,000 bar, 500,000 bars. So we're getting a lot of phase transitions, to, even down here, okay? The phase transition uh, from gaseous to uh, liquid, all right? Now the cloud layers, um, that's the interior, the cloud layers, um, the reddish-brown part, you know, Jupiter's got a lot of reds and browns and stuff, and they think that's from ammonium hydrosulfide. Whoa. NH4SH. A bunch of hydrogens, a nitrogen, and a sulfur. S-T-I-N-K-Y. Stinky. Stinky time. The whitish layers, they think, are ammonia. Uh, and then a little bit lower than that, water, water layers. So when you look at those beautiful rain, the, you know, the stripes of Jupiter, the great red spot, these are the things that you're, you're actually looking at, all right? Now, next time we're going to talk about the moons, the Jovian moons, and the, outer, and the outer planet moons. There's a lot to talk about there. Uh, I'll put together a small homework assignment for you, and, uh, and you're dismissed. Come on up if you want to get your exam printouts. Can you do the lights, please? Do you have a... I have a blank. If you have a blank or a double, just give them to me. Okay. Can you put this... Can you do the, um, the printouts? Yes, I'll call uh, Brandon has the... Go to this table with all the printouts. Yeah. And remember, students have to ask for them. Okay, great. Okay. We'll check it out. Double? Okay. okay. Hold on a second. Um, so I, I, about, um, I was told by the Hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. Let me...